Today I'm joined by Grace Jockson from the International Otter Survival Fund talking about the work that they do both in the UK and globally. Right, so firstly, what what got you initially into otters? We saw our first otter, we first came to Sky on a geology field trip and we saw our first otter when we were looking at the rocks and it actually became more interesting than the rocks, although the geologists wouldn't agree with me. But, you know, otters are they're totally different animals. You can think that you know what you're doing with them or how they're going to react, what they're going to do, and then they're going to do something totally out of character. And that just keeps you on your toes. You have to be aware in both the rehab side, they'll do something you don't expect. And also in the wild, you know, you just, I've got a brilliant photo of an otter in a tree in the wild in France. <laughs> and you would look for an otter high up in a tree. Right. So these things just keep you going. Yeah. So, so you, the, you're based on Sky. So did you, and then after that sort of encounter with the author, did you then think, well, we need to go live on Sky? I mean, how, how did you, how did that come about? Well, that's quite a long story, but we came on the field trip to Sky, and then afterwards we came back a couple of times. I thought we want to live up. We decided on the west coast because we thought it was a bit narrow to say just Sky, and we ended up living five miles away from where we first came. Right. And, and um, we set up Sky Environmental Centre to do trips on wildlife, geology, and a bit of archaeology. And then in 93, um, we decided we wanted to put money into something, you know, the money we were earning into something useful, as in conserving otters. And that's when we set up International Otter Survival Fund, so that we could put something back, as well as you know, letting people see these things, it's important to put something back. And we wanted to um, use the money to fund projects worldwide, to be honest, and that's what we're doing now. So, at the centre itself, like where, where you're based, you also rescue otters and you do international projects? Yeah, we have our headquarters are here on Sky. Yeah. Um, there's five of us work in the office. Um, but we share a lot of the tasks. Um, we do a lot of education work and we have our own um, team otter program for education, which Ben does. And then we do survey work and monitoring, which is where we are today, um, going out in the field. We have 15 sites that we check every year and make sure, you know, are they still active or aren't they? And that way we can monitor what's going on on the island. Um, and then we do research. Paul did his research into the way otters use the coastal area of Sky. And Sky, obviously, we came here on a geology field trip, but Sky is so varied for geology, and it's really important from the otter's point of view because otters that hunt in the sea have to have fresh water to wash the salt out of their coat. Yeah. Otherwise, it gets all manky basically and they lose the thermal regulation kind and of, kind of erodes the fur doesn't it yeah and it's like when you go swimming and see yourself you feel sticky yeah so you have they have to get that out so they have to have fresh water pool yeah. and you don't build up a fresh water pool on rocks of the forest so that down in slate you have um what's called only sandstone which sounds like it's going to be porous but it's cemented with silica deeper into it but so that you get a home range of about two to three kilometers for a female right. at the north end you've got the basalt lavas and they sound as if they're going to be nice and non porous but they're all cracked so there you can have 12 to 15 kilometers of coastline so it's all varied yes and that was caused research um and then we do training for to help other people do um auto work abroad we've had six in asia we had one in africa one in south america um and the idea is that we don't go in and say to people right this is the way you have to do it because in different cultures things don't work so yeah. we give them the basic tools of how to do field work how to do how we do education and then they can take yes that bit will work that bit won't and bring it all together so that they can 
do go out into their own communities and do work. And the last one we were in was Malaysia. And they've got a Malaysian Opera Network and they're really keen to get going and doing more work. We have people joining us from Myanmar, Cambodia, um, all over Southeast Asia really. So it's an effective way of getting people doing more Opera work because people in South um, Asia, there was hardly anyone working in Asia. And now with all these workshops, they're all getting going and, you know, doing their bit. Some are more focused on the education, some are on the field work, but it's just getting more info in. Yeah. So you, are you more, would you say you're more passionate now about otters and cons conservation than you were right at the start? Are you still as passionate, I mean? I'm still as passionate, we all are. I mean, it's very different. Um, it's, we spend more time in the office. I mean, people think that we go out watching otters all day <laughs> and, you know, we have this nice little cub that needs feeding and that's all we do. But that's not the main focus because, you know, with the little ones, if they're very small, they might be on a bottle, so they have to be fed regularly. But once they're feeding themselves, we feed them, check them and leave them right. so that they don't get used to people. And there's only two of us who feed them. So, you know, if for they're not, yeah, yeah. not humanizing them. Yeah, they're used to us, right. but they're not used to people, which is a very big difference. Yeah. And um, if we're away and somebody else is doing them, we often don't see them, which is what we want, really. So that when they're released, they just go back, which is the point. So, how many, I mean, in general, how many otters do you have at one given time? Do you have, is it? It varies. We've got six at the minute. The most right. we had at the time was 17, which was a bit standing room only. Um, but it varies. And the thing with otters that's different is that they don't have a breeding season. <laughs> yeah, so you don't have so like the, the baby birds yet. Yeah. No, you have no idea when you're going to be busy. Um, the winter is busier because the weather conditions are worse and there's this day length. Yeah. But we've had cubs every month of the year, so it just depends yeah again it keeps us on our toes you know you, you just don't know what we're going to do we've got one in just now who doesn't like white fish or didn't like white fish mm. so she we eat trout and think hmm it's gonna be a bit expensive we start <laughs> them off this sort of thing but this one was bigger when it came in right. um, and uh, when they're very small the first the solids they get are either trout or salmon because it's nice and soft and mushy and they can eat that. We finally got this one eating white fish, which is good. When do you, when do you typically typically release them? They have to be twelve to fifteen months old because that's the length of time they stay with their same. mother. Yeah, so same um, same as a wild wild cub. Yeah, because if you release them too early, they can't cope. And yeah. sometimes we've been about eight to ten months old, and they're perfectly capable of hunting for themselves. But somehow they've got separated from their mother and they don't really know what to do. So they'll end up in a garage or a shed. We've had one going to a school, yeah. um, pe through people's cat traps, all sorts of places. And it's because they don't really know what to do. You know, they can hunt, but they don't feel safe. So they just, why they think going to a cat trap and onto someone's bed is a good idea, I don't know. And they're, and they're released roughly where they were found initially. Yeah, because they know that area. We just. Yeah take them in and keep them until the proper release yeah. state and then put them back. I was just thinking if you, if you had any 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 ones that were found locally well, if you, and you released them locally, would, would, would they come back to where you live? We don't release that close. No, so you don't? I'm sorry, to be honest. We had one appeared in the neighbour's shed um, right. two months ago and uh, we released her. She was an adult, but she's got a mouth infection. And um, we we don't release them close to us. They probably smell something familiar. I don't know, but I'll, we wouldn't do it anyway. No. Um, better to find them somewhere nice and quiet, really. but not far from where they came from. But you know, we can get on with it. If we have got a place where there was a road that was like the last one we released, um, there'd been a road kill, unfortunately, just a little while before that, right. and so we her in there, which was, we knew there was a vacant territory there. So, we can monitor it too. But, um, rehab is always different. You know, 
people say sometimes, are you sad when you see them go? Never, I've never felt sad. The whole point is to bring them up to the point where they can go back. It's when you have them for a little while and then they die of something. That's when it's sad. Or if you've had one, um, a road accident and you've been getting into progress and it suddenly crashes. We had one that had been caught in a snare and he was a hor horrible injury. And uh, he, he got it, obviously got it off and he was keeping wound clean. Two weeks later, he just crashed and died. And it turned out the snare had been on so long that his heart was had it become enlarged to try and pump the blood round. Right. He couldn't survive like that. That sort of thing is sad. The relief is wonderful. That is sad. Mm. Well, um, if you have, if you have cubs in and and the cub doesn't make doesn't make it through, what what's the most common cause of that? Is it just illness, general illness? It depends. If it comes in and it dies pretty quick, we they all our otters that die and road casualties go through for post mortem. Yeah. So find out as much as we can about it because, to be honest, if they've died, let's get as much information as we can. Yeah, absolutely. So. If they've been with us just a short time, it may be that they were too debilitated before they arrived. You know, sometimes they've had an infection that's already well um, set inside, and they'll die within a day or two. We've had some with um, rare diseases. We had one which had Kaiser's disease, which, to be honest, I've never heard of. At that time, a great vet um, did PM down in... Um, Paul, Vic Simpson, and he uh, um, identified Kaiser's disease and it was the first case of that in an otto in the UK. But you, I think, you know, they, they send them all down and it might be a road casualty and that's obvious, but they take samples for um, toxicology. But sometimes you find other things out and as I say, it's worth finding out as much as you can. Yeah. Do you ever find like um is it like plastics within the otter that you know the fish have consumed? That kind of thing. Yes. Or is it mainly just pollutions? Yes. Um we had one um that arrived that had plastics and polystyrene in its brain. Right. So we don't know whether it was a case of it was eating that or whether that was in the fish. You know, so yeah. it's fine now. So it's, you know, it's passed it through. Well, as far as we know, it's fine. Yeah, it's just with the, with, with the ones that I'm watching, obviously, the, the, the bourbon otters. But then a couple of years ago, the, the mother was taking, take, took, a, took two plastic bags in to use as bedding. Like, yeah. And it's kind I've of come like up with, um, And it's almost like a damp course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have come across that for quite a while but not very often we'll take a feed bag in or something um, but they're not eating it not eating it it's a recycling but I, I don't know if i don't know i don't have experience with this but if the cubs are are a small age and they, when they start maybe start chewing around the den i mean i'm not sure or in the in the hulk itself i don't know to be perfectly honest um i would rather they didn't do it but no. on the other when I've seen it in there, I'm not. I can't really take it out. No, of course not. That's interfering, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, absolutely. It, it's what the otter wanted in there, so that's what it did. Yeah. But doing what they want. But I remember this was not in the sky. We were at a um, workshop in Taiwan, and someone had dropped a pizza box. And I thought the otter was brilliant because it, it sprayed it on top of it. And I thought, yeah, you said exactly what I would have said. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's all sorts of things that people do. I mean, apart from the deliberate snares and things, there's um, fishing problems, you know, where yeah. an otter gets um, fishing twine around it. We had one in Kyle Harbour that had... Uh, cable tie around its neck and that was horrendous no, it's been on so long and the otter had grown into it and its head was twice the size it should have been Jeez. and 
it's quite a funny story though because the harbour people called us and said it's in that boat in the hold and holds of boats don't have to be very well lit and tidy and all this sort of stuff so they pushed us in locked us in and said how long are you going to be well, i'm not going to be feeling around with my hands to see if i can find an offer <laughs> um we eventually got it out got it to the vet and he obviously cut it off treated it and it was released back into Kaya harbour because as an adult that's where it lived and the only reason it survived was because the fishermen were throwing it scraps right. and that helped it you know, but you could hear the breathing, it's horrible. And uh, after we released it, I think it was about three or four weeks later, we were contacted by someone who'd seen an otter about three miles up the coast and said, are you radio tracking with a collar? I said, no. And it was that same one because the hair hadn't grown back around the neck yet. Right, okay. And so it was obviously surviving and, you know, probably went back to the fishermen with small scraps now, it got more tame. Yeah. But it was a good one that they get released. But there's all sorts of things that people dump and just don't think about the effect on wildlife. It's really sad. Yeah, it is sad. I was gonna, I was gonna say, I know you said about releasing when you release the otters, it's not a sad moment. It's, it's, it's the reason what you're doing. But has there, has there, has there been like any specific like cubs or adults over the years that have been, you know, not, you know, kind of grabbed you more than others? Uh, they all grab you. You know, they, you get some that are aggressive, yeah. and which in a sense we like, to be yeah. honest, it means that they've got the wildness. In them. They've, we've had um, little, some of them are really pretty. Uh, we've got one that can't go back at the moment because she came from Mull two years ago and yeah. she's very tame. We got and we didn't back off when people went. We put in a remote enclosure, and she's not tame now. In fact, we haven't seen her for ages. Um, but she's eating well. She, she's doing everything right, except she won't go in water, right. which is a real technical hitch when you're an otter. It is yeah. So she's fine. You know, we can check her. You know, there's certain food there, the foot sensors there, the strengths there, but. She's found herself a nice little hidey hole, which is fine. She just stays there, gets her dinners delivered. We've had some that had um, hydrocephalus, which is, you know, the swelling on the brain. And that is sad because they come on really well. And you don't know, you know, they're feeding well, but they're not putting on any weight, which is a strange thing. And then they die and it turns out that's the problem. Have you have you ever have you, have you ever come across or had an otter with you that you've had to that you couldn't release that did did become extremely tame? Well, there's this one called Beltane, which she came on the first of May. It's the Gaelic name for first of May. Um, she's staying with us, <clears throat> and we did think that the one found in the shed along the road here was probably going to stay with us. But she was strange. She was sort of almost blonde, and that's often an older one. Right. And uh, then we noticed she, she'd got teeth. We thought, well, that's not normal. If, it, if it's an old one that's suffering, you know, we, and she would only eat on one side of the mouth. So she's got an infection. And she was perfectly fine after, and as I say, could be released. But we did also have a male, this was several years ago. And we had a friend who lived up, uh, about five miles away. And her husband was on the beach and the otter walked up to him. And he said, that's not normal. So he got the cat box, the otter got in it. And uh, they brought it down and it turned out he hardly had any teeth for all the time. So he became the old man Dax, who stayed with us for about two or three years until he died. But he was quite, he, he was different too in that one of the younger ones got, broke into him and he, he was quite content to have a cub in with him. Which I wouldn't have expected in the mail too much. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, if they have to stay, they have to stay, but the end aim is to get them back. Yeah, and that's the that and that's the whole the whole point. And that's the whole thing's rehab and that's why we we don't have visitors. 
because you know people want to see them all the time. No, and imagine, imagine you get probably. I guess you get inundated with people wanting to come and see cute, cuddly little cubs, but yeah. that's not that's not reality, is it? No, it isn't. At one time, we did have a visitor centre with a CCTV through to the office, but people weren't happy with that. They wanted to see the real thing, so in the end, we did away with it because yeah. we thought we can't give you what you want. You're not happy with what we're giving, so just stop. And so we don't. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. No. no I was going to ask. So how how I mean, the population on Sky, is that, is that stable? Is it increasing? With the amount it's, of tourists, is it decreasing? It's, um, part of Paul's PhD was looking at means of count, counting the numbers. You see, most surveys are done on straight. Right. And they estimate populations from that. And you can't do that. Um, we did a test for a year where we went out. We knew how many offices were in that area, two areas. And we counted the sprints and the sprinting points, and it bore no relationship whatsoever to the number of offers which we knew. So you can't say, well, we've got that much sprint. Anyone who's had an animal knows that an awful lot can come out the back end. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you can't say we've got a lot of offers because we've got a lot of sprint. And people, even up here, we said, get people saying, well, I saw one up here, I saw one there, I saw one there. So that must be three. No, it's the same one. And it's the same with the sprinting thing. Unless you're doing DNA, and so you can actually check the di which otter that DNA uh, that came from. Just because you're finding a lot of sprint doesn't mean you've got lots of otters. No. It, yeah, in this country and in most countries, to be honest, the population figures are given based on sprint, and you can't do it. But Hans Crook, who did work up in Shetland, he did a method where you count the number of active otter holes and there's a this is part of the board's work and I'm not a mathematician or anything like that. There's a relationship between the number of active otter holes and the number of resident females. And then you can calculate from that the number of resident females you've got over an area and then relate that to the males and cubs. But that is a means that you can use. Right. But I don't know how easy it'd be to do it in a river, um, because the river sections are longer. Yeah, I, just, I don't see how, I mean, I don't see how you, on a river system, a healthy river system, I don't see how you count the numbers properly anyway, because you've got so many ways in and out. Exactly, yeah. I mean, where we are, it's relatively easy. And you have to work out your formula before you start, because Paul had to count, have test areas and say, right, I've got that many fe resident females in that area and they're using that many holes. That means I can work out my model. And it's all very scientific and I can't understand it. That's his side. Right. I had um, um, an otter this morning that came back. I haven't seen her for about a year, maybe a year and a half on the river. She's oh. one, of the, one of the three, she was one of the three breeding, breeding females. And I got sent a picture this morning and looked at it and thought, wait, that, that was 2020. I think she last had a cub. Yeah. And she, she's turned up at the same place as the others. And it was just bizarre, like. That's strange, isn't it? Yeah. I wonder where she's been. Mm -hmm. You see, this thing, you, you'll never, ever, no one will ever know all about otters. That's okay. Because that, that's the best thing about otters, because I've. It's yeah, you know, that is the best thing. It's the, it's the not knowing, like you said earlier, about the unpredictable nature of each and each different otters, and they will look different as well. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And it's, it's, it means that when you go out, you might see something, I've never seen that before. Yeah. People ask you a question, you think, well, I don't know anything about that. I mean, I'm not it's one of these people who say, oh, well, yes, I know the answer to that, because you don't. There are things that you don't know. And just put your hand up and say, I don't know that. I'll see if I can find out. And if not, then you have to do some research, you know? It's all about learning. You've always got to be ready to learn something more because they're going to fool you at some point. Well, that, that, that's, re that's really why I'm really excited at the moment because I've done a lot of otter stuff. And then that, but every day now, it feels like I'm, I'm, I, I, there's and something else I don't know, but it's something that I have to find out. Like my, yeah. latest, my latest one is trying to look at this theory that, 
when she's collecting bedding for, for the, to line the hole with, I'm fascinated to see what she's taking in because she seems to take in anything that's really close, but she seems to make a um, more effort to go and get Willow and bring mm -hmm. that back. So I've been, I've been sort of asking, thinking about, is it because someone, I think someone said that they, it has like a, a natural antiseptic quality on the leaf <laughs> or do ticks not like willow leaf because they they get prone to a lot of ticks in, in that hole in particular. But she does seem to go very far for willow. That's really interesting. And these are the, these are the things that keep me up at night. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Well, we were in Otto and uh, she was collecting bedding it was on the coast and she was taking it below high water. And then we realised that they were low tides. Oh, yeah. So she had about two weeks that she could use that bedding in that hole. And then she'd have to move them. But she obviously knew the tides wouldn't reach her hole. Yeah. So how are otters doing glo globally in general? Well, there are 13 species of otter, um, from the giant otter of the Amazon um, to the tiny little Asian stork god, which I mentioned in terms of the illegal trade. They're the ones you see most commonly in zoos. Our own otter is the Eurasian otter. People sometimes say it's a sea otter when they see it in the sea, or a river otter in the freshwater, but it's officially the Eurasian otter because its range is across Europe, across Asia, and into North Africa. And that sounds brilliant, you know, it's such a big range. But when you consider that we know virtually nothing about China, Russia, and very little about, you know, sort of Northern Asia, it's just such a huge part of their range. And so their clusters near threatened. Um, all 13 species are listed in the red list from the rare hairy nosed otter, um, which is found only in Southeast Asia. The Ameri North American river otter is the only one which is regarded as stable. All the others are declining in numbers. And they are listed in the red list as least concern. Now that to us in IOSF is just false because they say that um, they're least concern and yet they're trapping tens of thousands of them each year, each year for fur and how they say it's sustainable well we don't agree with hunting anyway um, but if it's sustainable you've got to know how many you've got and then you've got to know whether that population was has enough capacity to lose certain ones for trapping well we know how many are being lost to trapping because we can get the official figures and at the moment it's about 20,000 this has come down a bit from 40,000, but that's only because the market's come down. And if the market goes up again, well, the number will go up again. Yeah. And they've reintroduced the uh, North American river otter into quite a number of states in America where they became extinct. And now they're trapping them again. So we know how many are being trapped, but we don't know how many they have in the first place. Every time we've asked, they say there's lots, there's plenty. Well, that's not quantifiable. If you're going to use science, you've got to be able to say we've got that many, near enough to an exact number and this is how many we're trapping and it just doesn't work and we've raised this question with the IUCN Otter Specialist Group so many times and they will not look at it which is why we're not members of the Otter Specialist Group because we can't be part of a group who won't tackle the problem of the North American River Otter in North America in the USA and Canada. No, I need so, to... Sorry. It, even if, even if, like you said, the, the population was healthy, stable, hunting is still wrong. And we're guessing the first being used for, for, for coats or hats or, or, or anything. Wrong. I mean, the, the otter specialist group agree with us that the trapping, uh, the hunting of otters in Asia is wrong. We all agree on that. But it's a different situation there because often it's a case of a fisherman and this what he regards as a pest is ripping his nets, taking his fish, and he's losing the money he needs to pay, you know, keep his family. Now, yeah. it's still wrong, but you can't criticise him and then allow it in America, you know, where people are doing it, certainly not for subsistence. Yeah. It's a totally different thing, and we can't be part of an organisation like that. 
Is um, hunting a lot is something that still goes on in this country? Officially, no. But we do believe it does go on. You know, um, they have mink hounds. Now, dogs are very, very smart, but can they definitely decide between a mink and an otter? And if they do know the difference and they come across an otter, what are they going to do? Yeah. You know, it's illegal. But I've had reports not that long ago of one particular hunt um, going out for mink. You know, it's just, there are a few mink hunts. We're working um, with the League Against Cool Sports, they're really looking into all this. Um, and hopefully they can do something. You know, it's, it's what's legal and what is enforced are two totally different things. Yeah, absolutely. So it's quite a, a, a very popular sport in, in, in obviously, Devon, Dorset, Cornwall, that kind of area. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I don't personally see what pleasure anyone can get from hunting any animal. Yeah. You know, it's just beyond my mind to understand how you can enjoy seeing an animal rip to pieces or set the dogs in and shoot it or whatever. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. No, I mean, you're, harm, you're harming the dogs as well as the, the animal you're hunting. The yeah, of course animal, you are. No, the dogs are getting badger baiting and things. Absolutely, yeah. It's horrific. And again, badger baiting is illegal, but it's catching them and enforcing it that's the problem. Yeah, it's not an enforced thing, is it? I don't think, to be honest. No. And I mean, it's the same with otters worldwide. They're, they may be protected in most countries, but, you know, it's enforcing that. That's why we have, when we have our workshops, we get the government officials in because they're the ones who are going to have to enforce it. I mean, there were otters smuggled in a suitcase in Bangkok, 11 baby Asian short poles. Is you know, it for the zoo trade? For the pet trade. Pet, pet trade. Yeah. And there's, um, we're working with a number of centres in Southeast Asia um, who take rescued pets. One of them in Indonesia has got 30. I think between the lot of them, they've got well over 100. I mean, it's ridiculous. So we're aiming to have more of a public awareness campaign to try and reduce the number of pets in the first place because that is the problem yeah well if you look i mean i mean when i go through my um on social media you see quite a lot of groups for things like pet hedgehogs pet otters pet everything groups now it's, it's it, those sorts of groups aren't helpful no they're not at all and it's supposed to be illegal to advertise animals for sale on facebook but mm. they are doing we know that. You know, we can find pet otters for sale quite easily. Mm. And um, as you say, pet hedgehogs. And then these cafes that I mentioned before, um, you know, where you can go and play with a little otter. I mean, you imagine a domestic cat or dog. Does it really want to be petted all day by different people? No. no. So how can you imagine something like an otter wants it? No, it's going to have a limit, isn't it? They're going to have limits where they just... Well, not a limit. They probably don't want it in the first place, but that kind of... No. Limit. And also when they're, you know, the conditions are kept in behind closed doors are not necessarily very nice because they're basically a tool, aren't they? A tool to make money. Yeah, and they're about as far removed from the natural sort of habitat as they're going to get. Exactly, exactly. And I don't know, to be honest, why they don't bite. <laughs> you know, that's what an animal will do, even your cat or dog, if it's had enough of you. It'll soon let you know. I suppose they'll take the otter out and put it out the back and bring another one in. But how many have they all got? You know, this is the thing. The number of otters in otter cafes is not known as well as it should be. No. No, I mean, I, I, I mean, my my main love of otters came from working with an Asian short tour otter in a, in, a, in, a, in a wildlife sanctuary. And um, she was rescued from a. a um, a private owner who was mistreating her and keeping her in pretty crappy conditions. So one of the, mm -hmm. I think one, she was quite she was quite old when she passed away, but she was um, it was kind of a good day when she did, if that makes sense. Like she, yeah, uh, it was you know, she educated a lot of people, got a lot of people in, into into otters or wildlife in general. So it's quite it's quite sickening that they could be used for. Like a, an attraction to make money when. Just a yeah. I mean, that's why we're working with these centers in um, Southeast Asia to 
get the four four main countries: Cambodia, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Thailand, to get them to have a a joint education thing, rather than each one doing their own. And that way, you can tackle it better, maybe. But we can't design it because we have they have to design what they want, so it's appealing to the culture of that country. You know what we might think is appropriate won't be. Yeah. So at the moment, they're looking into how best to do it, and then we'll help them. But do you think a lot of countries are generally moving in, in the right direction? That's hard to say. Um, I wouldn't like to say. I think there's certainly more effort in some of these countries with the police at um, catching traders, illegal traders, and the penalties are going up. So that is a positive side. Um, but how many are still sneaking through the, the net? We don't know. So in countries like, in, in general, somewhere like Asia, the, the main problem there is, is sort of abusing them for sort of, you know, being pets or you know, that kind of thing, more than them actually hunting them as a wild species. This, in Southeast Asia, I would say so. I mean, we were told, I've got something today about um, in parts of Africa, well, I knew that in parts of Africa they do have them for food, bush meat. Right. Uh, and this lot in... Uganda, I think it was. There's either Uganda or Nigeria want to. They're saying that there's less meat available, so people are eating otters more. And I'm thinking, well, there aren't that many otters that you could afford to keep eating them. No. They are bush meat in Af parts of Africa. Right. Because we worked with, we have worked with a lot of people who've had cubs or adult otters abroad. We, you know, over the years we've had phone calls from all sorts of weird and wonderful places saying, I've got an otter, what do I do? So 49 countries we've helped with. And one of them was in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And there was a, um, a couple who were missionaries out there. And someone, a fisherman, killed an otter and then found that she had dropped this tiny cub, which was about 10 days old, white, fur, blind, everything. So he took pity on it and took it to this missionary couple, Rita and Glenn Chapman. And for a long story short, they reared her. And she became sort of a real ambassador for otters because people were saying, what is this wonderful creature? Even people were coming from the government to have a look at and see what this animal was. And so she made, started to make people change their attitudes. And before that, they used to eat otters. And particularly in the area where they were, they put that to one side. And they've had, I think, about another four otters since then and set up the Kikongo Otter Sanctuary. And they've got two local men, Delphin and Seiko, who are really instrumental in caring for the otters. So, you know, it can be so important to spread the word and that that's what they've done with this otter. And she's now, got, well, she went back to the wild, this is quite a few years ago, she went back to the wild. So it's really good that, you know, you can get changes in attitude and um you know this is what we found with the workshops if we go in and tell people don't do this don't do that or do it this way they'll take that blind spit on notice and i can't blame them but if their own people are telling them in their own language it makes an impact and one of our people from the um african workshop is william Ngomo. And he's been doing so much education work. He's absolutely brilliant. He's spoken to over three and a half thousand children in schools. He's vi visited fishing communities and explained to them about otters and, you know, you shouldn't be killing them because they have a tradition that the otter has got uh, a root in its mouth and that helps it to catch the fish. So they try to catch the otter to catch, get the root to help them catch the fish. Mm -hmm. Now that might far fetched to us, but that's our culture and that's their culture. Yeah. And he's managed to persuade some of the fishermen to take out the otter traps, which is amazing. Is but it. if you didn't have said that, they wouldn't have liked to notice. That's incredible. Must must make yeah. you feel really proud, though. If you fought, you yeah, fought, fought I mean, when we, have the, when we have the workshops, we don't expect everybody to go rushing out and doing things. But some people go on with their life, but they've got a... Bit more, they might be a bird watcher, but they've got a bit more of an interest with otters and will 
communicate with us on authors in that respect. And then you get the Williams of this world, you know, who really is taking it on board. And he's got more people now wanting to um, help him. So he's setting up a little network. And he did a radio program um, last Sunday um, to explain to people about otters and the importance and people phoning in with questions and all this sort of thing. And that's really what you want. Yeah, it's like a pioneer of conservation, isn't it? Someone's, exactly. that's, that's, that, that change is not is not easy. And when someone takes that kind of, you know, takes it upon themselves to, to do that, that's 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 really impressive. Yeah. Yeah. That's how, that's, how ch that's how change comes about, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think he realises how big an impact he's having. He's such a um, modest guy, but he's brilliant. Oh, that, is, that is good. So what, what about, um, what are the hopes for the future for, for you guys? More and more, I think it's the answer to that. Do more um, conservation work, um, get more people involved. I say they don't have to be doing it full time, just, you know, participating a bit and spreading the word and making people aware that otters are an important part of our environment and our ecosystem. And with, without otters, the world would be a sad place. You know, we, we've got to work together. I mean, you'll always get some people who don't like, what, you know, otters and elephants and whatever. But the more people that join together, the more it's going to have an effect. I mean, it's like um, in the song Biko, um, light a candle. As you blow the flames, the wind will take it higher. So in effect, if you've just got one little candle and then there's another little candle and they all join, you suddenly got a big effect. That makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. And the children really are the future. You know, the more you can do with children. And they're really smart. You know, some of the questions they come out with, you think, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And they just see things from a different angle. And then they take it home to their mum and dad and say, I found out about this. Hey, we should do that. And, you know, that's the important way, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I was with them. Um, I was at the um, river maybe just early last year, I think it was. And this, this family had come up. And sort of like we're looking for otters. They're from I think they're from London. And this little boy came running up to me, and he just went otter, 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 and looked over, and then sure enough, there was an otter there. And this boy had, had, had demanded they'd gone to the river, come up to come up to Scotland, thinking you're going to see an otter because you're in Scotland. They were there for about ten seconds, and we, I've been there for hours, obviously. But this little boy, he just he just followed me around for about an hour, asking question after yeah. question after question. He's using words like crepuscular. I don't hear ad I don't, adults use the word crepuscular. It's one of, one of my favourite words. This little boy with his little tiny pair of binoculars, about eight or nine years old. Just I thought that's that for me is where it's at. I, lo I love showing kids um, otters yeah. and teaching about otters. That's that's the anyone seeing an otter is amazing. But when it's, I mean, I've got a three-year-old and he's seen otters double figures. I think now and now he's at the point where he can he can say what the otter's doing and. and, and he knows where I am if I'm not, you know, at home as well. Mm -hmm. that, that's the that's the biggest deal for me. All of our kids grew up with otters, you know, obviously. But um, although Ben is the one who does the education work with us, the other two will suddenly send a message. Just seen an otter, such and such, you know, and they're just so excited. Yeah, otters do that. It's like. I, I love all wildlife, but otters are like that. You never tire of them. It's like if you, it's like always seeing, the, every time you see an otter, it's the first time you've ever seen one and treat it like it's the last time you'll ever see one is the same same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, when we take people out, um, I really like it when they spot it themselves because then it's their otter. It's not me saying, look, there's an otter over there. Yeah they've spotted it it's their otter and they've had the pleasure of experiencing that themselves you know what i mean yeah they're a, they're a, a ridiculously amazing animal almost mythical to most people i think mm -hmm. when they yeah. yeah yeah i know what you mean well thanks for that that was brilliant grace
Well, many, many thanks to Grace Yoxon from International Otter Survival Fund. And you can find much more about what they do and how you can help at www.otter.org.